thank you all very much for coming here to my talk. So today I will talk about the fascinating chemistry of petroleum and what we can learn from it. So while researching for this talk and trying to find a suitable definition of petroleum, I came across this Nature article from 1918 entitled The Romance of Petroleum. So the title struck me as intriguing because I never thought of petroleum as something romantic. And yet, to me, petroleum is nothing but dull or banal. Its chemistry is truly fascinating because it offers a window into the Earth's distant past. And today, I'd like to convey this sense of wonder. I've been working on this product for the past 20 years, and boring is definitely not part of my job description. This article also gave me one of the most comprehensive definitions of petroleum, defined as any rock oil, Rangoon oil, Burma oil, oil made from petroleum, coal, schist, shale, peat, or other bituminous substances. The scientific definition is even wider, embracing natural gas, solid bitumen, and ozokerite. And today, I will use a broad definition of petroleum in this talk, encompassing both crude oil and natural gas. The structure of my talk will be as follows. I will talk about the relevance of petroleum today and in the future, and the role of Geoscience Australia. I will explain how petroleum is formed and what it is made of. And then I will use case studies to illustrate how the chemistry of petroleum can be applied to build Australia as a source wealth and understand the Earth history. So when it comes to fueling our cars, we may all very, um, in the near future, uh, we may all be doing this. However, for now, most of us are still doing this. I still I, I am, and that is my reality. In fact, this morning, I woke up, I took a shower, I dressed, I cooked some eggs for breakfast, and I had some bread for breakfast. I felt um, a headache coming, so I took some painkillers. Then I, uh, before leaving uh, home, I put a washing machine on. Then I drove uh, to work on a road, and a plane flew over my car while I was driving. And since I woke up, I've touched a myriad of things made out of plastic. All these activities have involved in one form or another petroleum-based products. And this is because petroleum is not only a fuel for transport, heating, or electricity generation. It also provides the essential building blocks for chemical manufacturing. These building blocks are also called petrochemicals. And here is a, a non-exhaustive list of things made out of petrochemicals. They are also part of a modern energy system in batteries, electric vehicle parts, insulation, solar panels, and wind turbine blades. So what is the relevance of petroleum today for Australia, starting with crude oil? So Australia is, a, is an oil producer. However, as you can see from this graph of world oil production, it is a fairly small oil producer on the world stage. In fact, uh, Australia's oil production doesn't meet our domestic demand, and we're heavily reliant on oil imports. This reliance on oil imports affects our energy security, as Australia has only 21 days uh, worth of petrol stock. When it comes to, to gas, the story is quite different, because Australia has a lot of gas resources to the extent that Australia is a net gas exporter. And in 2018, Australia has become the second largest liquid natural gas exporter in the world. However, a number of factor, factors have led to a potential gas shortage on the east coast of Australia, highlighting the need to secure domestic gas supplies. The upside of these exports is that they are a major contributor to Australia's wealth and prosperity. Oil and gas exports have contributed to 60 billion uh, worth of revenue for the year 2018-19. The oil and gas sector is also a major employer, employing more than 100,000 people directly and indirectly. So what is the relevance of petroleum in the future? We will still need petroleum in a low carbon world. The International Energy Agency predicts that oil and gas will still be part of the energy mix in 2040. And that is even the case in their sustainable development scenario. 
And that is the scenario that maintains the increase in temperature to below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. But what the international energy also predicts, as well as others, is that the future of petroleum may not lie as a fuel for transport or electricity generation, but as a supply of chemicals. Indeed, petrochemicals are becoming the largest driver of global oil <coughs> consumption. So what is the role of Geosan Australia when it comes to petroleum? One of GA's key strategies is to build Australia's resource wealth to maximize benefits from energy resources. In order to do that, our 10-year plan is to map and understand Australia's energy resources, reversing Australia's increasing dependence on oil imports and increasing domestic gas supplies. It is critical to understand that the exploration industry relies heavily on the uh, geological data inf and information that GA provides free of charge. For example, 50 years of Geosan Australia's work program has led in 35 billion of investment in offshore ex petroleum explorations since 1985. And Geosan Australia is unique in that it provides data and information on a national scale. Here uh, is a screenshot of our newly built uh, GA portal, displaying geochemical <coughs> data for the whole of Australia. And for the first time, by putting all this data through this portal, we are building a national scale understanding of our energy resources. But in order to understand our energy resources, we first need to understand how petroleum is formed. That is fundamental. And petroleum formation starts with biology, lots of it. Lots of algae, bacteria, some zooplankton, land plants. These algae uh, tend to grow in nutrient-rich surface waters, uh, which, uh, such as regions of upwelling, which bring nutrients from the ocean bottom to the surface waters, leading to these green algal blooms seen in this video. These algal blooms uh, develop in a zone of the um, water column called the photic zone, where light penetrates because algae carry out photosynthesis. Once the organisms die, they rain down to the bottom. However, most of the organic debris are recycled back to carbon dioxide before even reaching the bottom by decomposition with microorganisms or chemical oxidation. However, these organic debris can be favorably preserved if bottom waters are anoxic, that is devoid of oxygen. Anoxic bottom waters can develop if they do not mix with surface waters due to stratification. Example of environments favorable to petroleum deposition include lakes, such as Lake Cadano in the Swiss Alps, because um, this lake has permanent anoxic bottom waters. Deltaic environments, such as the Gange Delta, which is one of the largest uh, delta on Earth, and restricted marine seas. And a modern analog for this is the Black Sea, because 90% of the deep waters of the Black Sea are anoxic. So eventually, these organic debris will collect in a layer, which will then be, uh, start to get covered with other sediments, such as mud, silt, or sand. Eventually, this organic layer will get buried and subjected to increasing temperatures and pressure. Eventually, over time, this organic rich layer will become lithified and what we call a source rock, typically a mudstone. And you'll notice that this layer is not horizontal anymore because it has been deformed by the movement of the earth over time. When this source rock uh, continues to be subjected to increasing temperature, it will start generating oil and gas. However, for this to happen, the source rock has to have a high enough organic carbon content and a high enough hydrogen content. And the higher the hydrogen content, and the more likely the source rock will be able to generate oil as opposed to gas. The, as the um, oil and gas form, they will eventually seep out of the source rock to reach a rock called a reservoir rock, typically a sandstone, because sandstone has, are highly porous and permeable and act as a sponge to the oil and gas. The oil and gas will eventually collect 
in what we call a trap, and they will remain trapped thanks to the presence of an impermeable rock called a seal. So what the message I'd like you to take out from this series of slides is that if there is no source rock, there is no petroleum. So it's fundamental to understand the distribution of source rocks, what they can generate for the oil and gas exploration. In this example, if you know that this crude oil comes from this source rock, you can map the extent of this source rock and predict over oil and gas accumulation. Likewise, it's very important to understand if the, if the oil comes from a deeper source rock, because if that is the case, then you can map the deeper source rock and find other prospects. So understanding the source rock is key to predicting the location of oil and gas accumulation. But how do we relate crude oils to source rocks? How do we make this link? Here are pictures of crude oils taken from Geoscience Australia National Oil Collection. You can see that uh, these crude oils vary a lot in color, from being colorless to yellow, orange to black. We can measure the density of these crude oils relative to water. We can measure their viscosity, that is their resistance to flow, whether they are any like honey or thick. However, apart from these very basic properties, you're pretty much limited. And the only way to characterize oils and gas is to look at their chemistry. And the great principle is that oils and gases retain the chemistry of their source rocks. In order to analyze a source rock, you first need to extract it with an organic solvent in order to get a source rock extract. Once you get a source rock extract, you can process it as you would a crude oil. And correlating crude oils to source rocks is all comparing their chemical fingerprints. Crude oils and gases are mixtures of hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon is a molecule consisting of hydrogen and carbon. The simplest hydrocarbon is the molecule of methane, which is one carbon atom bonded to four um, hydrogen atoms. Now you can add one more carbon to get the molecule of ethane, one more and you'll get the molecule of propane, one more and you'll get butane. However, when you get to four carbons, Start, uh, things start to become interesting because there are two ways of arranging the molecule of butane, as a linear chain, like that, or as a branched hydrocarbon, such as isobutane. The same chemical formula, C C4H10, but two uh, structural arrangements, which are also called isomers. Understanding isomers are, is also part of a fingerprinting process. Here are different representation of the same molecules, and chemists like to even simplify even more by not displaying all these uh, atoms. And this is the representation that I will use from now on. So natural gas, which we collect in cylinders, are primarily composed of methane. They also consist of ethane, propane, isomers of butane, isomers of pentane, and some C6 hydrocarbons. These are the wet gases. Natural gases can also contain inorganic gases, such as nitrogen or carbon dioxide, and traces of helium, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide. But all in all, a natural gas is only composed of a few components. The story is quite different for crude oils, as they contain hydrocarbons which vary in length from five carbons to 40 carbons or more. And each time you add a carbon, you multiply the number of isomers. For example, for a C20 hydrocarbon, the theoretical number of possible isomers is more than 300,000. Crude oils do not have all these theoretical isomers, but still they have a good number of them. By C5, you can start having cyclic rings, such as cyclopentanes, C6 rings, such as cyclohexanes. You can have multiple rings. You can also have aromatic hydrocarbons. So to summarize, crude oils are a highly complex mixture of thousands and thousands of compounds. So how do we analyze these complex mixture? We use an instrument called a gas chromatograph that will separate these mixtures into individual compounds based on their volatility and molecular weight. The result of this analysis is a gas chromatogram where each peak represents a compound. And in this example, the oil contains hydrocarbons which vary from 5 carbons to 36 carbons. 
We're all aware that the fuel that we use in our vehicles are distillation cuts from petroleum. And here is the range of hydrocarbons for petrol, for kerosene, for diesel, and for fuel oils, which are used in tanker ships. And hidden underneath these big peaks are very small molecules, very specific molecules, which I'm going to talk about now. So we're all familiar with the concept of fossils. Fossils are the remains of once living organisms found in rocks. Biological molecules, and in particular lipids, such as this cholesterol, which you are all familiar with, can also become fossilized during burial to become what we call a molecular fossil. Molecular fossils differ from their biological molecules due to chemical transformation during burial. However, you can notice that the uh, main structure remains the same. So molecular fossils, which you can trace back to their biological precur precursors, are also called biomarkers. And biomarkers have been found for all three domains of life, for bacteria, for archaea. Archaea are uh, these primitive single-celled uh, microbes which tend to live in extreme environments, such as hydrothermal vents, and archaea, to which plants and animals belong. Biomarkers can reveal very import important information about a number of things. They can reveal about uh, the depositional environment of a source rock. Was it deposited in a marine, versus lacustrine, versus fluvio-deltaic environment? Was it deposited in a carbonate, versus clay-rich sediment? They can reveal information about the uh, water chemistry. Was the water column uh, hypersaline or anoxic? They can reveal about biological inputs to the organic matter. Were there lots of algae or bacteria or land plants contributing to the organic matter? They can also reveal information about the age of the source rock. So here is a geological time scale, which is divided in time periods from the formation of the Earth to the present. Petroleum is an extremely slow process that takes millions of years, which is why we consider petroleum as a non-renewable resource on the human time scale. And some of the youngest petroleum are neogene in, in age, such as oils of the Maracam Delta, so they are at least 20 million years old. The oldest uh, commercial oils are um, neoproteozoic Cambrian in age, such as oils of the Sulfurman Salt Basin. And petroleum has been formed from source rock, having been deposited in between these times. So will these two oils be uh, similarly from a chemical point of view? Will the chemistry of these two oils be alike? Well, it won't, because what has happened in between this time is evolution. Living things have evolved. They have uh, changed. Some have gone e extinct. Some have appeared. And here, highlighted here, are some uh, key events in the uh, evolutionary history of life on Earth. This evolution is reflected in the fossils that we see in rocks. Similarly, it will be reflected in the molecular fossils. For example, the molecule diterpenes, which are related to land plants, do not become abundant until the Silurian, uh, that is, after the evolution of land plants. Likewise, the molecule oleanin, which is related to flowering plants, will not become preponderant until the late Cretaceous, that is, after the evolution of flowering plants. So we can use molecular fossils to date petroleum. Another powerful tool in our chemical toolbox are stable isotopes. Carbon has two stable isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13. What is different between them? They have the same number of electrons, the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. And photosynthesis favors C12 over C13, which means that photosynthetic organisms, such as plants or algae, will discriminate against carbon-13. And this affects the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratios. And these ratios are uh, analyzed using an isotope ratio mass spectrometer, which we have in our laboratory. We can also measure the carbon isotopic uh, composition of individual compounds in natural gas, crude oils, and source rocks, and we obtain these carbon isotopic profiles. So 
to summarize, we have um, two fingerprinted tools, the chemical composition, and that, these are the peaks, and the uh, carbon isotopic composition, and these are these uh, profile. Now I will use case studies to illustrate what the chemistry of petroleum can teach us. And I will start with the offshore Northern Perth Basin, which is located on the southwest margin of Australia. The Northern Perth Basin is an oil and gas producing region since 1971. Most of the exploration activities are focused onshore. And exploration onshore is still very active, with uh, new gas discoveries having been made onshore in recent years, including the Wetsia gas field, which is deemed to be the largest onshore conventional gas find in the past 40 years. One of the key source rock uh, onshore is the Upper Permian Lower Triassic OVA member. Offshore, there is only one producing oil feed at Cliffhead. And there's been uh, discoveries as well, gas in Perseverance and Franklin, and oil and gas in the well Dunsboro. But apart from these discoveries, there is a lack of exploration success offshore. And this lack of exploration success offshore was thought to be due to the fact that the OVA member source rock, which is the key source rock onshore, was absent offshore, leading to a perception that the offshore Northern Perth Basin was not prospective for oil and gas. So at GA, what we did, we set out to ground truth this perception by analyzing rocks. We collected rocks from offshore wells. Oil and gas companies provide these rocks to our repository. And we had access to a different sample type, from cuttings. Uh, cuttings are little pieces of rocks dislodged by the drill bit while it um, drills through the rock, the, the rock. We had access to sidewall cores, which are little core plugs taken from the side of the boreholes. And we had access to cores. Cores are collected as you would push a straw into the earth, pull it out, and split it open to recover what's inside. The um, sample quality increases from cuttings to sidewall cores to cores, as is the sampling cost. So we collected these rocks, and we analyzed them using a workhorse of the uh, screening for source rock quality called a Rockeval instrument. A Rockeval instrument is like an oven that heats the rock in, it, in, it, in inert gas at 25 degrees per minute. And this simulates the burial and heating of a rock. The rock being heated will generate hydrocarbons, and the hydrocarbons released are, are measured throughout the run. The Rockeval instrument gives two very important parameters, the organic carbon content and the hydrogen content. And these parameters can be plotted in an XY uh, plot with the hydrogen index on the uh, y-axis and the organic carbon content on the x-axis. So these plots can help answer fundamental questions such as, does the rock contain enough organic matter? And for this, a rock needs to have an organic carbon content above 0.5%. Anything below that is not considered a source rock. Is the rock capable of generating oil, gas, both, or neither? For this, uh, if the hydrogen index is above 300, the rock will be likely to be able to generate oil. If it's in between 50 and 300, it will be most likely to generate gas. And below that, it won't be able to generate anything. The controlling factor um, for uh, oil proneness versus gas proneness is biological input. If you've got lots of algae having contributed to the organic matter, the uh, rock will be more likely to generate oil. If you've got lots of land plants, it will be more likely to generate gas. So we've applied uh, and analyzed the um, offshore of MMO source rocks um, by um, using this instrument. And we saw that they, in fact, contained quite a lot of organic carbon associated with high hydrogen contents, which meant that these source rock offshores were actually good to excellent source rock for generating oil. And the best source rocks uh, offshore were located in this red outline area, that is where the uh, hydrogen index is above 250. So this data was proof that the OVEA member offshore was actually of good quality and were widespread. 
but you can have a good source rock. However, if it has not been heated enough, then it has stayed idle and not generate any hydrocarbon. So one way of proving that uh, source rock has been active is to find evidence of related fluids by looking at oils and gases. So we collected these oil and gases, as well as oil stains. And oil stains are just uh, rocks impregnated with oil. And then we did our fingerprinting exercise. We looked at the chemical composition of the OVM member source rocks offshore. And what, we, uh, what it revealed is a very uh, interesting compound, the C33-N-alkyl cyclohexane. And this compound is very specific to the OVM member because it is not found in Jurassic, Middle and Upper Triassic, and Permian rocks. So when we did the chemical analysis of offshore crude oils, we saw that they also contain this compound. And because this compound is so specific to the OVM member, we were very confident that the source of these offshore crude oils was the OVM member. So we had a good match. Our fingerprinting also involved a carbon isotopic composition, and in particular, this isotopic profile. Here is the range of data for OVM member source rocks. And here is the range of data for Permian source rock and Jurassic source rocks. When we analyzed crude oils, we could see that they were within the range of OVA member source rock. Again, an excellent match. And offshore gases also were within the range of um, the data for OVA member source rocks. So we were confident that the offshore gases and the offshore crude oils had been sourced by the OVA member. So this study, the outcomes of this study was that we were able to uh, relate the oils, oil stain, and gases at this well location to the OVM member. And this meant that the OVM member offshore had been active over a widespread area. Therefore, the perception that the OVM member source rock offshore were absent or of poor quality was completely debunked. This work resulted in the uptake of Exploration Permit W1118, representing more than 71 million worth of work program, including free exploration wells. This permit is now, now owned by Pilot Energy and Key Petroleum, and the website of Key Petroleum uh, cites our source rock study. What this study also uh, taught us is very important information about a particular time in Earth's history. Indeed, the OVA member straddles the Permian Triassic boundary, which means that it was deposited during the end Permian mass extinction event. So we're all familiar with the Cretaceous tertiary uh, extinction event, which brought on the uh, extinction of dinosaurs. But before then, we had four mass extinction events in the past 500 million years. And the greatest of all extinction is the end Permian extinction. It is estimated that this end Permian extinction uh, killed 90% of marine life in ocean and 70% of life on land. This extinction uh, is so severe that it has been called the Great Dying. So what caused this mass extinction? Well, a bullied impact was suggested as a possible cause. But to date, there is no robust evidence to support this hypothesis. Another possible cause is volcanism from a large portion of today's Siberia. Flood basalt eruptions uh, in, in this uh, part of the world started just before the end Permian mass extinction. And the timing is just too great to be a coincidence. This flood basalt eruption form the Siberian traps, which are a pile of lava hundreds of meters thick. And these constitute one of the largest known volcanic events on Earth. So it's not quite clear how the, um, these er eruptions might have caused the end Permian mass extinction. But the release of massive amounts of volcanic gases may have led to global warming and ocean acid acidification, among others. Now, a third possible cause was suggested on the basis of geochemical analysis, because it revealed that the OVA member contained a biomarker called isoranerotene. And isoranerotene is a marker for anoxic shallow waters containing hydrogen sulfide. 
This compound has also been found in over Permian Triassic section uh, at this location on the reconstructed map of the late Permian, which meant that anoxic oceans were widespread at the time. The overturning of this water might have led to the release of toxic, massive amount of toxic hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere, resulting in death by poisoning. So my second case study is the Browse Basin. The Browse Basin is located on the northwest shelf of Australia. And the northwest shelf is like the oil and gas hub of Australia. The Browse Basin is located here. And what is special about the Browse Basin is that, is that it has started production of liquid natural gas only last year. And it is contributing to the um, uh, fact that now Australia is the second largest liquid natural gas exporter in the world. Liquid natural gas is just methane cooled at minus 62 degrees so that it becomes a liquid. Once a liquid, methane can be easily transported in specially built <coughs> tanker ships. The Bras Basin is maybe one of the best illustrations of the impact of the work that GE can have on resource investment. In 1997, Geoscience Australia carried out a big petroleum prospectivity study in the Browse Basin called the Browse Basin High Resolution Project. As a result of this study, INPEX acquired the exploration permit in the Browse Basin. In 2000, INPEX found the largest single discovery of petroleum since the 1960s, the Ictis gas field. And 18 years later, the Ictis field commenced production of liquid natural gas, as well as the Prelude field, which is the neighboring field of ICTIS, and operated by Shell. The Browse Basin is expected to bring 72 billion worth of revenue for Australia over the next 40 years. So that's quite a big return on investment. The 96-97 study had focused on understanding the source rocks in the Browse Basin, and three key source rocks were identified the Jurassic Plover and Lower Vulcan Formation, and the Lower Cretaceous Echucasual Formation. The study also focused on understanding the oils in the Brass Basin, because at the time, gas was not such an attractive commodity. However, the Brass contains way more gas resources than it does oil. So in 2013, GE reassessed the petroleum prospectivity of the Brass Basin, this time focusing on understanding the source of the gas. And this study was able to identify four petroleum systems, and it was able to redefine the extent of this petroleum system related to these source rocks. This work was promoted at various conferences and promotional tours. And a great testament to the impact of this work is the uptake of available permits in the Browse Basin after the promotion of our work. Now my third case study is the Roebuck Basin. The Roebuck Basin is also located on the Northwest Shelf, next to the Browse Basin. However, as you can see from this map of the wells, it is one of the least explored regions of the Northwest Shelf. And the, the Roebuck Basin was identified as a frontier basin with significant potential in GA's offshore basin inventory. But in 2014, a major oil discovery was made in the well Phoenix of one in the Roebuck Basin. This led to a renewal of exploration activity in the area, leading to more discoveries, including oil in the Dorado field in 2018. And this a discovery is being hailed as Australia's biggest oil discovery this century. What is special about these discoveries is that they've been made in Triassic sediments. When most discoveries on the Northwest Shelf are being made in Jurassic or Cretaceous reservoirs. So everyone was very excited because everyone thought that maybe the source rock of the Phoenix of One oil was an equivalent source rock to the marine oil prone of a member of the Perth Basin, which I've talked about previously. <coughs> so at GA, we set out to understand the source of the Phoenix of One oils. We collected oils, we collected rocks. We were very privileged to have access to these beautiful cores in our repository. And without going into uh, the details, 
the outcome of his study was that the source rock of the phoenix of one oil was nothing to do with the ovarian member or an equivalent to the ovarian member. It was not an oil-prone marine source rock. The source rock was more consistent with a near-shore lagunal setting. And while these source rocks were found to be some of the best source, rock, source rocks on the Northwest Shelf, they also were found to be able to generate as much oil as gas. Importantly, the Phoenix of One Oil represents a new petroleum system on the Northwest Shelf. And this study highlighted the need to revisit the Northwest Shelf for Triassic and other source rocks, because this has never been done before, and it could lead to new prospects. The results of this study contributed to the recent uptake of exploration permits W184 and W185, which represents more than 200 million worth of work program, including four exploration wells. Now, my last case study will be to apply petroleum chemistry to study Precambrian rocks. Precambrian is the earliest part of Earth history and spans 90% of Earth's existence. It starts with the formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago. At this time, Earth was very hellish because it was very hot. But eventually, Earth cooled and oceans were able to be formed. And then, in some way, somehow, life happened. The first living organisms were prokaryotes, which are single-celled um, organisms with no nucleus. Stromatolites, which are mounded colonies of photosynthetic cyanobacteria, became preponderant in the Archean. And cyanobacteria uh, fundamentally change the Earth's atmosphere by adding oxygen into it. Before the cyanobacteria, there was no oxygen on Earth. Then the Precambrian uh, saw the emergence of eukaryotes, to which um, algae, plants, animals, and fungi belong. The timing of these events is hotly debated because the um, Precambrian fossil record is very patchy. Fossils in the Precambrian tend to be um, scarce and poorly preserved. And this means that molecular fossils are very well suited to the study of Precambrian rocks. And now I will focus on this part of the time scale, which saw the emergence of animals. Ancestors of most animals uh, living on Earth today appeared at the base of the Cambrian, in an event called the Cambrian Explosion. Before then, there's hardly any fossil record for animals. It's as if animals suddenly appeared out of nowhere. And this enigma really uh, puzzled and mystified Darwin himself. Before the Cambrian Explosion, you have the Ediacaran biota, which are soft-bodied organisms because no shell or skeleton were able to be found. This Ediacaran biota, or most of it, uh, disappeared before the Cambrian explosion. So before joining GA, I was a research fellow at MIT in Boston, working on the petroleum perspectivity of the South Oman Salt Basin in collaboration with Petroleum Development of Oman. The South Oman Salt Basin hosts the oldest commercial oils on Earth, which are sourced by the neoproteozoic Cambrian Ukov supergroup. And during this study, we identified molecular fossils related to sponges in Sophoman crude oils and rocks. And yes, sponges are animals. They're even our deepest, oldest ancestors because they are at the base of the animal tree of life. We found a continuous record of the sponge biomarker signal in rocks in Oman from the cryogenian to the early Cambrian. And the finding of this sponge biomarker signal in cryogen and rocks represents the oldest current fossil evidence for true animals. So this means that animals were there before the Cambrian explosion, but maybe just poorly preserved. So you're going to tell me what is the relevance of studying Precambrian rocks in Oman for Australia? Well, as it happens, Australia has a lot of Precambrian rocks. And here is a map of Precambrian basins in Australia. The sponge biomarker signal was detected in the officer basin. The Exploring for the Future program, which aims at understanding resources in northern Australia, has had a big focus on the Precambrian basins of the MacArthur Basin, the Georgina Basin, and more specifically, the Bitalu Subbasin and the Soft Nicholson Basin. 
Armor Energy is one exploration company uh, working and exploring in the South Nicholson Basin. And recently, Santos announced that it had um, interest in the, some of the exploration permits of Armor Energy. And following this announcement, uh, the Armor Energy Executive Chairman Nick Matter stated that in contrast to other locations such as the organic rich Proterozoic Basin in Oman, that are several billion, billion uh, oil barrel fields, the South Nicholson Basin has not really been touched and could represent one of Australia's great opportunities for the discovery of a new hydrocarbon frontier province. So what we, whatever we learn in Oman can be directly applied to Australia. I'd like to acknowledge everyone involved in these uh, geochemical studies, and I apologize if I, if I forget anyone, and in particular the commitment of the uh, present and former staff at the uh, GE laboratories because they greatly contribute to the quality of our geochemical data set. And I'd like also to say a big thank you to my dear colleague Diane Edwards because she's such a powerhouse of the field of organic geochemistry at GA. I will finish this talk with pictures of our recent uh, visit to the drill site of the Wokali Kali One well, which is being drilled at the moment in the Canning Basin. Uh, this uh, will provide insights into the petroleum prospectivity of the uh, Canning Basin, which is one area of focus of the Exploring for the Future program. And I very much look forward to uh, working on this beautiful course. Um, and who knows what we might learn on the uh, history of life on Earth looking at this cause. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>